Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the special council meeting of Tuesday, October 26. Um, we're going to hear from some agency presentations. Council is here in person with a few staff, but all our agency presentations will be done by Zoom. So we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, can I get a motion, please, for the adoption of the agenda? Councillor Elmsley, seconded by Councillor O'Reilly. All in favor? That's passed. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest on today's agenda? Seeing none, uh, I just got a quick announcement to make. Uh, in October, uh, children's aid societies across the province will raise awareness about the important role that individuals and communities play in supporting vulnerable children and youth. On Dress Purple Day, taking place tomorrow, Wednesday, October 27th, we celebrate Kawartha Lakes as a community that cares for families. Together with our human services staff and community partners such as our local Children's Aid Society, we share the message that help is available, no one is alone. I invite you to wear purple and City Hall will be lit up with the purple lights uh, tomorrow evening. If you wish to learn more or find resources or make a donation, www.hkcas.on.ca. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to item four, which is deputations. We have none. Uh, we'll move into our, our item five, which is a report. We're going to get a quick overview from uh, Carolyn Danes, our treasurer, on the summary of the external agency budget requests and the report that was included in your agenda. Welcome, Caroline. Go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yes, the uh, I, I thought this year it might be helpful for for um, council to have a summary of all the uh, the allocations that have come in from all of the um, external agencies that some you'll hear from today and some you'll have written correspondence as well. So I uh, did a comparison of um, the allocations for 2022 versus the allocations for 2021 and showed you their increase or decrease in the case of some of them. So uh, it's uh, all there in the attachment. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer anything. Okay, we'll get a motion. Uh, the motion on the report, that report Corp 2021-016-2022 summary of external agency budget requests be received for information purposes. Councillor Almsley and Yo, are there any questions for Caroline on the report? Councillor Dunn, go ahead. Yeah, I've heard there's going to be some increases uh, coming forward. Um, I'm looking at the Kawartha Police Services budget in particular. Uh, is that question better to ask uh, Chief Mitchell and uh, Chair? Uh, okay, thank you. I'll talk to them. Yeah, they're coming to do a presentation shortly, okay, so uh, you can certainly uh, ask your questions then. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions regarding the report? Seeing none, we have a motion to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Uh, next up is correspondence. So we have correspondence, the 2022 annual billing statement from the Ontario Provincial Police, the OPP, uh, from Phil Witten, Superintendent Commander, Municipal Policing Bureau. Can I get a motion to receive that correspondence, please? Councillor Yo, seconded by Councillor Dunn, any questions on that correspondence, item 6.1 from the OPP? Call the question, all in favor? That's passed. 6.2 is the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, 2022 budget, Mark Critch, General Manager, Corporate and Financial Services, Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority. Can I get a motion to receive that correspondence? Councillor Yo, seconded by Councillor Vale. Any questions? on that correspondence. All in favor? And that's passed. 6.3, uh, the Autonomy Region Conservation Authority 2022 budget, Dan Marini, Marin, Maringe. Did I get that right? Close. CAO Secretary Treasurer, Autonomy Region Conservation Authority. Can I get a motion to receive that correspondence, please? Councillor Richardson, second by Councillor Elmsley. Any questions on that correspondence? All in favor? That's passed. 6.4 is the Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority 2022 budget. Linda Lallybert, uh, CAO Secretary Treasurer, Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority. Receive that correspondence, Councillor Richardson, seconded by Councillor O'Reilly. Any questions on that correspondence? All in favor? That's passed. 
2022 budget presentations, item seven. We'll move right into our first presentation is item 7.1. There's a Halliburton Kortha Pine Ridge District Health Unit, 2022 budget presentation. Um, I believe Dr. Bocking is going to join us. There you are. I don't know about Angela Vickery, uh, but uh, your presentation. So welcome, Dr. Bocking. There's Angela Vickery. Welcome. And uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to see everyone virtually today. And thank you for asking us to come and present uh, updates on our programs and services and our budget for uh, 2022. Um, so I, I will try and move through the slides relatively quickly. Uh, so if we could advance to the next slide, please. So just a, a background reminder around uh, public health governance and, and how we find ourselves today. So the uh, Provincial Health Protection and Promotion Act really sets the legislative mandate for boards of health and for health units. Uh, as part of the act, we then have subsequent regulations that uh, detail, for example, uh, which infectious diseases are reportable uh, and other measures that are for enforcement under the, the health unit. Uh, what we rely on really as a minimum outline of our, our programs and services is the Ontario Public Health Standards, uh, which outlines those programs um, in, in some detail and what the expectations are from both the Board of Health as well as the health unit staff. So next slide, please. I think one of the things that um, we're continuing to try and um, help uh, help people to understand is, is the difference between public health and the healthcare system. Uh, so the, the core functions of public health really, uh, we, we can summarize as five different core functions, but the bottom line is public health is about prevention, uh, preventing illness, disease, injury. It's about promotion of well-being and health. Uh, and it happens at a population level. So whereas the healthcare system is often about one-to-one -one clinical interactions, much of what public health does is at a community or a population level uh, in helping to prevent whether it's spread of infectious diseases, whether it's prevention of foodborne or water illnesses. Uh, really, our, our mandate is, uh, is somewhat separate and distinct from the healthcare system. So moving on to the next slide, please. A quick reminder about what we do, I've provided some broad buckets or categories of the themes of work that we do. Uh, all of our programs and services are driven by public health evidence, uh, including data, uh, as well as working towards health equity. Uh, we know that uh, public health programs, while well, often not seen, uh, contribute to an incredible return on investment. So by investing in prevention, we're preventing people from having to, um, to receive a care in a hospital, which is certainly much more costly. The types of work that we do uh, in, it ranges, so for example, in healthy environments, everything from food premise inspections uh, to uh, food safety handler training and certification. With infectious and communicable diseases prevention and control, we have uh, both reportable diseases, outbreak management, vaccine preventable diseases, immunization of school pupils, um, a, a wide variety of programs and services. For safe water, for example, we have beach water testing and sampling in the summer. We have inspections of small drinking water systems. For healthy growth and development, our, we have our Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program, which promotes maternal, newborn, and uh, early childhood development, including home visiting um, with family home visitors to promote uh, healthy, safe early childhood development. Our school health team has primarily, certainly since COVID, been focused on COVID uh, case and contact management and support for infection prevention and control. But outside of COVID, we also have uh, programs in oral health screening, uh, as well as vision screening in schools. I've spoken a bit already to, to immunization. Uh, if we move on to substance use and injury prevention, so programs including harm reduction, uh, naloxone distribution, uh, other policy work to promote uh, safe activities, greater activity, um, and, uh, and overall promotion of wellness. And then chronic disease prevention and well-being, um, similar programs to substance use and injury prevention. This obviously is not an exhaustive list of all of the programs and services. Uh, and if we move on to the next slide, please. I also want to highlight how, um, how 
a, a great focus of our work for the last greater than 18 months now has been on responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. So like all area, other areas of the healthcare system, uh, we have had to make choices about, uh, about what programs to continue, what programs to put on hold as we diverted resources to responding to the pandemic, as well as um, having a, uh, certain, certainly some premises uh, closed due to lockdowns or other um, provincial restrictions that have been in place throughout the pandemic. So I provided a, a shorter list here that certainly isn't exhaustive, but an example of those programs that have been maintained throughout the pandemic, uh, in addition to our actual COVID response. So and the majority of our environmental health programs have continued. Uh, certainly while food premises were open, our inspections continued, small drinking water system inspections, tobacco enforcement, uh, case management, outbreak management of other reportable diseases, so not just COVID-19. Uh, some programs have continued, but were adapted for more virtual work, such as Healthy Babies, Healthy Children. School health has continued, although primarily in COVID response, um, and then certainly work around harm reduction. We ha do have some services that are resuming, uh, not quite at 100%, uh, but resuming throughout this fall, which includes sexual health clinics, as well as our school-based immunization program. Uh, we have a, a cohort of 2,400 students that are due for their, their routine grade seven, eight uh, immunizations, um, half of which had missed their, their immunizations last year. And then we still have some programs that remain either offline or uh, done in different ways. So our oral health and vision screening uh, programs are, are not up and running yet and likely won't be until the winter or early spring. Uh, in addition, our, uh, our work on other health promotion campaigns and policy work has largely been put on the back burner as we have had to continue to divert resources to responding to COVID-19. Next slide, please. To give a quick summary of uh, the types of activity and work that has uh, been done during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think uh, now the words case and case management, contact tracing are, are familiar to most members of the public uh, regarding the work of public health, uh, outbreak management, uh, disease surveillance, and you're likely familiar with the dashboards that are available on our website that uh, indicate not just COVID-19 virus activity, but as well as progress in a vaccination campaign, support for infection prevention and control, communication, public education, uh, enforcement of public health restrictions, and then of course, a, a huge amount of resources dedicated to the planning and the rollout of COVID-19 vaccine uh, immunization. Uh, and that certainly continues to this day as we look towards a very busy upcoming couple of months uh, with regard to COVID-19 immunization. Certainly lots of information available on our website. And if there's any, uh, any specific questions related to uh, the pandemic response, uh, I'm happy to, to field those as well. On to the next slide, please. So coming specifically to, uh, to funding, uh, I, rec I know that you had a presentation by Dr. Ian Gamble, who is the Acting Medical Officer of Health at the time for Halliburton Court, the Pine Ridge District Health Unit, uh, just this past February. And he outlined, outlined some of the historical um, changes that had occurred to funding for public health. So as a very brief reminder, uh, in 2020, the province changed its grant uh, to boards of health from or, to a 70-30 uh, split. Uh, and I think what was uh, noticeable about this is that it applied uh, not just to those programs that were previously cost shared between the province as well as boards of health, but it also applied to programs that were previously 100% funded by the province. Overall, this resulted in a shortfall for the uh, Board of Health of $1.217 million. Next slide, please. So despite the province announcing some mitigation funding for, for health units and boards of health for both 2020 and 2021, 
the mitigation funding, as you recall, was not sufficient to, um, to fully fill that gap. Uh, and what resulted was an increase in the levy to, uh, to taxpayers uh, through the city of Corsa Lakes for uh, of 10%. And this was applied in 2020 and in 2021. And I've, I've included in, the, in this slide the actual uh, dollar amount of the increase for both of those years. So next slide, please. I wanted to highlight our, our ongoing steps to mitigating expenses. Uh, in 2019, the health unit undertook um, a significant review of all of its services to find um, efficiencies to streamline services. Uh, we do have staff that are trained and certified in lean principles and have implemented this across the organization. Uh, and we're continuing to identify uh, methods that we can improve our efficiencies. And I think it will certainly be interesting as we move um, hopefully beyond the pandemic and look at the role of, of virtual services. Uh, although certainly there's many programs and services within public health that do have to be done in person. Next slide, please. So in uh, September of this year, the Board of Health for HKPR approved uh, our budget for 2022. Uh, the uh, calculations for a budget include not only our base operating expenses, as, but also projections for ongoing work related to COVID-19 pandemic response, as well as those costs associated with program uh, restarts or catch up. Our budget includes a, a, a we are expecting to receive mitigation funding again from the province. Uh, as a result of that, and as a result of ongoing kind of work towards identifying efficiencies, uh, we have uh, committed, or we were able to decrease the anticipated levy that we had thought we would have to uh, apply from 10% down to 5%. So uh, our, um, the increase of the levy this year is that of 5%, which is a total increase of $112,477 specifically to CKL. And I've included here uh, what that means for uh, the overall absolute amount for CKL for 2022. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, I think there's certainly many unknowns as we uh, continue to uh, work at containing COVID-19, preventing its spread, and hopefully looking to come out the other end of the pandemic uh, re and resume other uh, important work within public health uh, to prevent illness and, and promote health. Um, despite those many unknowns, I think really, if anything, what the pandemic has demonstrated is, is the need for a robust public health system uh, to be able to respond to not just public health uh, emergencies, uh, but also to maintain those other core essential services that uh, we know that residents do rely on uh, and are key to preventing uh, illness throughout our community. So with that, I will, I will close up this presentation uh, and happy to to answer any questions that you might have today. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Bocking. I'm just gonna get a motion to receive, Councillor Elmsley and Richardson. Um, questions, Councillor Dunn, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bocking, for your presentation. Uh, when the province mitigated the sharing of costs uh, from 100% uh, to 70, 30, um, that amount that's quoted, how much would it have been if they hadn't mitigated. What I'm trying to get a handle on, I guess, is what I'm looking at in 2022, if they don't mitigate it, uh, what the actual cost would be. Can you help me out there? Uh, so I, I might have to ask Angela, uh, but if I understand your question, the amount that we have received in mitigation funding previously is around $778,000. Uh, and we've received that amount the past two years and are expecting to receive it again for 2022. So unmitigated, that cost would have been in the $800,000 range as opposed to the uh, um, $100,000, $200,000 range. Am I, uh, am I on board there? I haven't got the slide right in front of me, so I've kind of lost track as to what the numbers are. Yeah, yes, that's correct. Okay, all right, that's fine. That, that, that's close enough. Um, We'll have to work with the province a little bit harder, I guess, going forward, see if they keep up the funding. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Seymour Fagan. 
Thank you, and through you, um, to Dr. Bocking. I have a question. Um, everybody, well, different municipalities and different agencies received funding for COVID-19 over the past few years. How much funding did uh, the health unit receive over the past two years? So uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so the, the province has committed to funding uh, COVID-19 expenses directly. Uh, at this point in time, we've received 48% of our request uh, of what we put into the Ministry for COVID-19 expenses. This equates to about $1 million. So we're anticipating to if we receive the remaining 52%, uh, we'll be just around $2 million or, or just over that. Okay, thank you. And I'm wondering about your staffing. Um, everyone also seems to have issues with staffing. I'm wondering if you have a full complement and if you've hired any more inspectors over the past two years. So we have, um, we have increased our complement actually quite significantly as a result of the immunization program uh, for rollout of COVID-19. Uh, these are all contract staff, so they're not uh, permanent staff members. Uh, starting with the introduction of the immunization campaign last spring, we increased our complement by approximately 35 individuals. So this is primarily I've, um, individuals that can vaccinate directly or individuals to uh, enter data into the system. We also had some additional staff come on to support our, uh, our call center and our COVID support teams. Uh, in anticipation of further immunization pressures this fall, we are recruiting again uh, for both vaccinators, so people that can uh, administer vaccinations as well as data entry staff. And right now we're, we're quite ambitious, but hoping to recruit an additional 20 to 30 people specifically to support uh, COVID-19 vaccination rollout. Okay, thank you. And so that money is recoupable from the government through your COVID expenses? That's correct. Okay, great, thank you. And I'm wondering about your actual inspectors, if uh, the amount of inspectors have been um, increased over the past two years, your permanent full-time inspectors. So I might, over the last two years, I might have to turn to Angela here. My understanding is that permanent uh, public health inspectors that complement uh, has been potentially increased by one this year, but otherwise has not changed. Although, Angela, I'll look to you to correct me there. No, oh, that's correct. We're increasing it um, right now by one. So you're increasing this year? That's right. Okay, thank you. And what, what would the cost of uh, that employee be? Angelique, are you able to answer that one? Yeah, it's approximately 80000 Thank you. Any further questions for Dr. Bocking? Go ahead, Councilor Riley. Uh, this may uh, be more operations, uh, either Dr. Bocking or to Doug. Um, when Brighton was eliminated, uh, taken away, is this an amalgamation of uh, two offices, or are they looking to further amalgamate, or were there discussions around that? Brighton was closed a couple of years ago, and uh, the staff in Brighton was moved to Port Hope. Uh, for the most part and uh, so the saving was in rent and travel for the most part and Angela can correct me if I've misspoken that's that's correct no personnel no I I don't recall whether uh, there were personnel changes as a result of that or if everybody moved from Brighton to Port Hope. My understanding is everyone moved to Port Hope. Thank you. Any further questions for the health unit? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you very much for your presentation today and joining us. We appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Okay, we'll move into item 7.2, which is a Kawartha Lakes Police Service 2022 Operating and Capital Budget Presentation by Mark Mitchell, Chief of Police, and Don Thomas, the Chair of the Kawartha Lakes Police Service Board. Can you gentlemen hear me okay? Hear you just fine, thank you. And we can hear can, you, so you. we can hear you just fine, so go ahead, please. 
Well, good afternoon, Mayor Latham and members of council. Uh, thank you once again for allowing us to present our budget estimates. Uh, as you know, I'm joined by the chief this afternoon and I'd like to thank the chief and his staff for the work on this budget, as well as recognize the time and effort and understanding that the members of the police service board put into the development of the 2022 budget estimates. We do have a small slide deck to present and then Chief Mitchell and I will answer any questions that you have. And if I could just have the first slide. And this first slide is an overview of the budgets for 2020, 2021, and the proposed 2022 budget. We'll certainly come back to that for at any time that there's questions, but I'll direct your attention to the right-hand column, which shows an increase or a decrease of the 2022 estimates compared to 2021 police budget. The bottom of that column shows our request for 2022 at 6.44%. Just before we move on, halfway down that column, you'll see the, uh, the percentage increases and you'll see one at 20.78%. And that indicates uh, it's under communications and that's a staffing increase in that area that Chief Mitchell will speak uh, about in a few minutes. And then two thirds of the way down, there's another one that's marked at 100% increase and it's under the Correctional Institution Unit. As you're well aware, we lost uh, funding from the provincial government on this, but the demand for service is still there. So it becomes a separate budget line. And uh, what was previously paid 100% by the province, we received no funding for now. And the final one that I'll draw your attention to is right at the bottom of the page where it shows 100% and it's just entitled Building. It's for building maintenance and historically uh, the board and the service, uh, this budget line hasn't been in our budget. Uh, so it represents a new expense to be in there. If you just move to the next slide, very brief slide, but just for your comparisons, uh, it shows the increases uh, that we've had in our budget since 2018. Uh, and if you take a look at our five-year running average, it sits at about, uh, I think it's 2.8% uh, overall. So uh, historically, we've tried to stay within budgets uh, or within council's guidelines. Uh, however, as times move on, we seem to be falling behind and you'll hear a little bit more about that. So the next two slides, I'll, I'll call on Chief Mitchell to present, and this will give you an overview of the situation that the police services face in our justification for the budget increases. Chief. Thank you and good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, I just wanted to open by saying, uh, we know that this is a, is a big ask. Um, it's not a decision that we took lightly and it's not a number that we arrived at arbitrarily. Um, we, uh, we did a complete organizational review in 2020 uh, and that combined with a uh, public consultation process that took place earlier this year really guided uh, our, our future plans. Uh, and I'll speak to some of those uh, staffing plans in uh, just a moment. Some of you uh, are also aware of the, the public information session that we held uh, last week uh, at the armories and some of the feedback that we got from the community uh, in that regard. Just before I speak to staffing uh, in particular, uh, draw your attention to a couple of things. Our reserve uh, currently sits at $377,000 to uh, try to keep the uh, budget uh, at a manageable level. We've applied $200,000 of that reserve funding to our 2022 budget. Uh, as Mr. Thomas mentioned, that uh, 145,000 in uh, operational maintenance is a new expense, uh, not a complaint by any stretch. Uh, we're happy to include that, but that was not previously uh, captured in our budget. So that is a new uh, expense and um, contributes to some of that increase. The Central East Correctional Center, as Mr. Thomas just alluded to, that is, uh, uh, staffing that we are required to do uh, even in light of the province's decision to discontinue funding for that. That is uh, not a uh, Core of the Lakes um, driven uh, requirement, uh, but nevertheless, the, it is a cost that is borne by the taxpayers uh, municipally now and going forward. And we are not 
the only community in that uh, predicament. Uh, so that is a uh, generally rated uh, expense. And uh, I'll just note quickly that uh, in spite of the uh, large uh, budget increase overall with the growing community, uh, the impact on the area rated uh, taxpayer is on average about uh, $20 annually compared to 2019 figures. Next slide, please. With regards to uh, staffing, we wanted to make sure that uh, we were prepared to meet the needs of a growing community. But we wanna make sure that those resources are applied uh, strategically and intelligent. Uh, so what we, uh, what we are proposing is uh, an expanded community response unit to put resources uh, where they're needed when they're needed uh, and to tackle the most uh, pressing problems in our community. So that's uh, what we come up, have come up with. Uh, this will increase our uniform staffing complement by two additional officers in 2022, uh, plus uh, one additional officer that's already uh, been brought into, uh, brought into our numbers this year in 2021. Uh, the capital costs for a lot of uh, that initiative will be covered by uh, development charges. And we're in uh, conversation with the city uh, in regards to that. We also have an application into the province uh, to provide up to $100,000 in uh, funding to support that initiative, but that has not been uh, approved and so is not recorded in the budget uh, at this time. Uh, as Mr. Thomas also alluded to, uh, and largely uh, driven by the feedback from our operational review, our communications uh, footprint will increase uh, with the addition of four hours of coverage during our peak call volume period, uh, seven days per week, and will provide a better level of uh, coverage both to the police and to the fire service. And I should note that the fire service is uh, bearing their proportionate uh, share of that cost. Uh, so with that, I think that concludes our presentation. And uh, of course, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for that, appreciate it. I'll get a motion to receive, Councillor O'Reilly, seconded by Councillor Dunn, and questions, Councillor Dunn, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chief, for your presentation. Um, one quick comment. Uh, thank you and your staff for the uh, for the open house you ran. Uh, it was well organized. It was well ran. Um, it's kind of a scary proposition when you go down a road never traveled before, but I think it was well received uh, by the public. And to stand up there and say, "Tell me what your beefs are and take your best shot," takes some moxie. Uh, thanks, Sergeant Haggerty, for uh, for putting it all together. Um, my first question uh, is on training. It's the, second, uh, it's the second budget in a row where I see there's been a reduction in training. Um, I honestly believe that one of the reasons why we, ha we have such a well-run force is because our officers are highly trained and uh, it might be something you'd want to consider or reconsider because training to me is 90% is of what, uh, what makes a good police officer. So I, I am discouraged to see the amounts going down. Um, CRU stands for? My apologies, I should have uh, clarified that. That is our community response unit. Thank you. Um, and I assume that's, um, that's gonna address some of our downtown problems and whatever, whatever problems happen to, uh, happen to pop up. That is 100% correct. Uh, our uh, rationale is to uh, provide specific um, involvement in some areas including an increased partnership uh, with forecast addiction services to provide addictions related outreach in the community. Uh, but a significant portion of that unit's mandate will be uh, supporting uniform operations in those areas that you uh, just mentioned, uh, the downtown core, uh, patrol presence, foot patrol presence, uh, traffic management, uh, those sorts of areas. Thank you, Chief, for a good 2021, and hopefully we'll be just as lucky in 2022. 
Thank you. Question, if I might just add a comment to uh, the Councilor Dunn in regards to the police training, it's not that uh, the police training hasn't increased but changed its face somewhat. Uh, training now, a lot of it, as we see with this particular meeting, a lot of it is done online and off-site. So we're not paying nearly as much money in travel time, uh, housing and meals as we once did. So training still remains a priority. And, uh, and I think our staff are, are doing well. It's just the structure of that training has certainly changed over the years. Thank you, Chair Thomas. Thank you. Uh, further question, Councillor Helmsley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, both of you, for the presentation. And one of my questions, uh, I don't know if uh, you'd be able to answer it or not, but I, I'll ask it anyway. On your building maintenance line, uh, is building maintenance not done by community services for that building? And would it not be in their budget? I, I can probably answer that. It was in the future. It was in the past in the community services budget, but it's been allocated to their budget. So you should see a corresponding decrease in the community service budget. It's come out of their budget onto the police budget. Thank you. And, and my next question, and I'm remembering back uh, a couple or three years, I think, might be even longer than that. There was some, communic there was some problems with the communication system uh, that the fire department seemed to be experiencing in terms of uh, lag time and calls or uh, something to that, um, something like that. Have all those problems been cleared away now and is this communication plan looking after everything uh, as it is expected to? Thank you for the question. Uh, I. We are in regular uh, contact uh, with the fire department with regards to the uh, communications partnership that we have. I'm not aware of any uh, recent issues or concerns in the last uh, couple of years. Um, I can't, I can't uh, speak to anything offhand uh, further back past that, but there hasn't been any issues. We're also closely working uh, with them and as well as with the city on the implementation of next generation 911, which we uh, expect will become operational in 2022 as well. Uh, I may be recalling that it was a 911. Uh, there seemed to be difficulties with 911, and I don't know if uh, those have all been sorted out or what you're alluding to now will straighten out all those problems. <laughs> There are no current uh, 911 issues that I'm aware of. Our, um, our call answer and uh, dispatch times uh, are, uh, are, very, uh, are very good. Thank you very much. I, th I think what you might be alluding to is in the past, there was some issues between the fire department communications, like their walkie talkies through different divisions, but it wasn't a 911 system, it was them. So maybe when they do their presentation at operating, that'd be a good question for them. Okay, any other questions regarding uh, the police uh, service budget? Okay, we have a motion to receive, all in favor? And that's passed. Thank you, gentlemen, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move down to item 7.3, which is Kawartha Conservation 2022 budget presentation. Mark, Mark, Mark Mahowski, Chief Administration Officer, Administrative Officer, Kawartha Conservation. Welcome, Mark. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and wonderful pronunciation of, of my name. I know it has a lot of vowels and consonants in it. So, uh, so great job on that front. It's my responsibility as chair to get your name right. So go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor O'Reilly uh, and members of council. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present our proposed uh, 2022 budget to you. Uh, I'd like to recognize the members uh, of our board as well that sit on our, uh, as members of our board, Councillor uh, Dunn and Councillor Seymour Fagan, uh, and of course, uh, Mayor Latham, who serves as the chair of our, our board. Uh, we have a very productive board and, uh, and the city members are a key piece of this. 
Uh, just moving to the next slide, uh, which illustrates our budget process. Uh, we are at the beginning process uh, of our, our budget. Uh, we've produced a report in September, which gave a, a guideline, which was uh, which was reflected in letter to you, uh, which uh, um, outlines a, a general uh, outlook for for our budget uh, moving forward. Uh, we're at the in a couple of days, the detailed draft budget, uh, which will be going to our board uh, in two days time. Uh, and that'll get refined uh, to the point of budget circulation, which we expect later this year uh, for budget approval uh, with these timelines we're expecting uh, early in, uh, in next year. The, the next slide identifies what that general outlook is, which is a 2.5% increase in municipal operating levy. That is, uh, works out to about uh, just over $40,000. And due to a poor uh, changes, which are forwarded to us by the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, uh, that results in about a 2.17% increase for the city. The, the next slide identifies the different components of our our budget, which you see listed there. And I do have another slide that's hidden. It probably won't show up when we're uh, running through the slide, but it details the project components and, and what those uh, uh, elements are. Uh, but those are the components uh, for, for levy and, uh, and special projects that we undertake on behalf of our municipalities. Um, and the budget is also supported by a number of revenue sources, uh, program generated, generated revenues in the form of fees for service and any grants that, uh, that we're able to access uh, from federal government or, or other sources. Uh, the next slide identifies uh, some of our budget pressures that, uh, that we see, and some of these are, are kind of developing and some of them are, are ongoing. Certainly there are two major influences in our budget, and that would be the pandemic and all things that kind of come with it, um, including shifts in, uh, in how work is done and uh, kind of expectations from, uh, from our stakeholders and community in general. And, uh, and the other is uh, the Conservation Authorities Act changes, which we'll expect to, uh, to see. There may be some, some influences as we move forward. Certainly uh, agreements are required by January 1st, 2024. And, uh, and at that point in time, uh, that will certainly impact on the budgets and the general format uh, that, uh, that is offered. Um, the, the next slide identifies uh, the proposed funding for, for your municipality, uh, kind of summarized on, on one slide compared to the previous year. Uh, and you can see there the operating levy, all the projects uh, um, are slight decreases uh, in, in a general sense uh, across the, the areas. And you see we've included the service agreement, uh, the RMO, which is actually funded from a departmental budget, uh, but everything's in there for, for you to see as a, as a whole. Uh, we're still adapting to the pandemic, uh, so there are a couple of areas where we are funding things from deferred revenues. The, the next slide, uh, I'll go into uh, each of those major uh, components. So general benefiting projects are those that are shared amongst the uh, municipalities, a decision from our board to carry these out. Uh, we have two, two projects that are identified. Uh, digitization of corporate records, which is a an ongoing uh, component. Certainly during the pandemic, this was a key factor to our success and our ability to meet client demand. Uh, having access to files is certainly important, and uh, we did find that whenever we slowed down, it's because something wasn't uh, wasn't available for us. Uh, so, uh, so certainly important to uh, to do that. And then the the other component is the uh, design or application uh, for our website that allows our IMS uh, to be opened up uh, on the permitting side and allow people to have a more uh, user driven experience and figure out where their application is. Uh, so it, it removes the mystery. We we had started this uh, last year and uh, had some initial cost estimates uh, and uh, deferred that uh, due to the cost estimates being a little bit higher than we had uh, originally anticipated. Uh, the next uh, next slide identifies um, our uh, special levy uh, project request, and that includes uh, all things that are either in uh, specifically funded by City of the Lakes or in concert with uh, perhaps another uh, another municipality. Uh, and these are largely directed uh, towards the implementation of our of the lake management plans, and uh, and that is a key component. Uh, we know it's. Uh, uh, within the city's strategic plan and, uh, and something that we try and uh, leverage funds uh, to the greatest extent possible. 
uh, the, these are impacted somewhat by, uh, by our pandemic uh, measures and, and trying to make sure that we're uh, responsible with the funds received and, uh, and also uh, looking at uh, deferred revenue and trying to, uh, uh, trying to make sure that we make up for, for our pandemic year in, uh, in 2020. <clears throat> uh, there is a joint uh, implementation of rural stewardship program with, uh, with the region of Durham, uh, and this was something that was implemented last year by combining forces for programs that have similar uh, types of scope, but we're able to attract some significant grant dollars. And, and, uh, and then uh, the Lake Dalrymple Lake Management Plan, uh, many thanks to, uh, to the city for considering that request, uh, and so the 2022 would be the second of uh, four years. Uh, for for that project, uh, the next slide um, identifies uh, each of those uh, specific projects in turn. Uh, so we have the uh, the lake management implementation, and in this case, what I've done is I've combined uh, both of those uh, those pieces: the the special benefiting for city uh, uh, specifically, and the joint project with the region of Durham. Uh, the the important part of the, about this plan, of course, is uh, is the sustainability of the lakes that uh, that are that the economy relies upon in this area. Um, some of the lifestyle choices and recreation uh, uh, kind of economy that's uh, built around the lakes as well. So uh, we find that engaging the community is a really important part of uh, of this plan. And uh, and when you have a community that uh, cares, you're always going to win. So that's what we're we're really interested in. We've seen some uh, some really good uh, work being done by uh, uh, by a number of uh, people supporting this. Uh, the uh, the important part here that I'll point out as well is the deferred revenue component. So this uh, this implementation plan is supported uh, by $105,000 of deferred revenue. Again, trying to catch up uh, due to some pandemic. Uh, um, uh, influences that uh, that we're dealing with. The the next slide uh, is the Lake Dalrymple uh, management plan, and uh, I think the slide lays it out pretty well. Uh, we're, we've implemented that. Uh, we're certain to um, meet with a Lake Dalrymple working group in order to help steer the development of the lake management plan, and we have uh, started uh, monitoring uh, the lake in order to establish baseline and figure out areas that uh, uh, that need addressing. Uh, so that is the the budget uh, summary overall and what I'll move into is uh, just a few highlights for for your interest on the next uh, several slides um, in terms of what we've been doing and uh, some of the things that uh, that are pretty exciting I think for uh, uh, for what we we do and our our role with the with the community uh, certainly a pandemic response has been a, a pretty major component, uh, trying to make sure that we're compliant with all the legislation, making sure our staff and uh, our patrons are, are well taken care of and are safe. Uh, and of course, our business practices have continued to adapt over, over this time. Uh, certainly, we had a, a big period of innovation in uh, uh, 2020, and in uh, 2021, we've continued that and also made sure that everyone was, uh, uh, was uh, kind of abreast with all the changes that, uh, that were made. So, uh, we've we've also shifted our, our communications in a lot of ways uh, to to make sure that we have a different way of interacting with uh, with our community. Since uh, of course it's very difficult to uh, to do things the way that we used to. Uh, we have focused a lot on our website and uh, social media, uh, trying to make sure our our activities are self-directed. Uh, so the the person that's trying to do something uh, has an ability to do it on their own time. And uh, we found that's uh, been very successful in including uh, uh, doing things like remote visits and uh, and some interesting applications in our conservation areas where we have uh, a storybook trail, which uh, you can send your kids on. I know my, my little one and Enjoys us quite a bit, and uh, so one trail she wants to do every time she goes to the uh, uh, to the conservation area is uh, uh, read the storybook uh, that's there. So it's a it's a great uh, community initiative uh, that we partnered with the library on. And the Talking Forest is another one where uh, you can download an app and uh, and it uh, when you're walking in the in the forest uh, the trees start talking to you. So it's a, a neat way of of combining a, a couple of innovative solutions for. Uh, making sure that uh, people can do things in a self-directed way. Uh, the next uh, next slide uh, identifies some of the business improvements uh, that we've made. Certainly, I mentioned the Conservation Authorities Act changes, and there will be some some more activity on on that file in the years to come. 
Uh, but we also have a new strategic plan uh, that was approved by our board, uh, which you'll see fairly soon. There's uh, one element uh, that we're going to add to the strategic plan in order to, uh, in order to round it out. Uh, and uh, once that's done, uh, you'll see it very soon. My thanks to, uh, to your CAO, uh, Ron Taylor, who uh, agreed to allow the expertise of uh, Brenda Stonehouse in the development of this uh, plan, uh, we're working with our staff. And uh, it's, a, it's a product that we're really proud of and, and really sets a good direction for us into the future. Uh, we also invited a First Nation board member to, uh, to our governance table. Uh, so that's, uh, we're actually first in the province to do that. Uh, and, uh, and some other aspects that we worked on were related to our governance, uh, uh, our planning services, and uh, making our information available. And you see a sample of that from our website uh, on the slide there. I uh, wanna make sure that the information we collect is, is available for, for everyone to use. Um, the, the next slide, uh, which ties into the planning and uh, permitting client service initiative, which is initiative uh, cross conservation in Ontario uh, and conservation authorities across Ontario is um, uh, is looking at our permit timeline. So a couple of years ago, there was an agreement to reduce our timelines by 33%. And, and that's in the analysis and uh, preparation of comments and, and eventually the approval of, uh, of permits. Uh, and you see that uh, we've been doing fairly well. And in, in fact, uh, last year, uh, it was an exceptional year for making sure that we met those timelines. Uh, and, uh, and this is a, a new kind of, um, uh, reporting that we're doing to our board as well, and we're happy to to share that uh, with you here. Moving on to the uh, some of the highlights of our management plan implementation on the on the next couple of slides. Uh, the community grant program is extremely well subscribed. Uh, it's a little bit of incentive for landowners to invest in the in properties and and make a positive change on the on the landscape, uh, looking to reduce erosion, for instance, on on lands and um, and it is something that has a tremendous uh, return on investment. Uh, you can see there, $30,000 awarded, but uh, $170,000 in project value. Uh, so really tremendous uh, uh, that the community is investing in things that, uh, that uh, are improvements on their property and really help out the entire watershed. We also met our goal of uh, across the watershed of planting uh, 21,000 trees uh, and uh, the city um, supported uh, forestation program uh, was, a, was a good piece of that. So, uh, so a great success story uh, meeting our, one of our goals. The, the next slide identifies a number of demonstration sites, which uh, are either ongoing or, or completed in, uh, in the city. Um, and you see it focuses in on agricultural and urban environments. Uh, they are supported uh, well with uh, a couple of grants, uh, which is great. Always nice to leverage dollars. And uh, and these we are shifting. Originally, uh, this was pre-COVID. Uh, we we're planning on doing a uh, uh, some in-person site visits and uh, and some uh, some conference shows. But uh, but this is now changing over to demonstration videos, uh, which in my mind is is great because it provides a, again a user direct. Um, ability to look at the materials whenever you want and still have access to it. Uh, so, so that's uh, tremendous. Um, and, uh, and the next uh, slide uh, that I have for you identifies some of the science uh, uh, highlights that we have. Uh, so near shore monitoring was identified as a gap in our lake management plans. And we have uh, almost 50 citizen scientists uh, uh, working with us on identifying the near shore. So uh, we did background work on, on the lakes and the lake management plans and, uh, and the near shore environment was identified as, as an area that can identify hotspots. So, uh, that's what this program is geared to do. Uh, the aquatic uh, plant control, I think everyone else calls them weeds, uh, but uh, this is really a bubbler or thruster that's put in the water. And as you can see in the picture there, it does produce uh, some effects that allow uh, landowners to move their boats in and out of the channel uh, a little bit easier. Uh, so this is uh, a, a technology that is uh, not uh, necessarily currently supported by permitting agencies uh, because there's a, da uh, a data gap, uh, a lack in, of information in terms of what the impacts are. So this, this study is meant to improve that. And we are seeing that the regulation agencies are, are quite interested in this work um, and was another program again that uh, we had to adjust due to uh, pandemic circumstances. Uh, and sediment erosion control, uh, uh, we are producing a number of videos and fact sheets in order to help our development community. Uh, and this uh, ties in with a number of site visits that we conduct 
looked in order to see where erosion control was working and where they were uh, not working and uh, sediment was getting into uh, waterways and, and lakes. Uh, of course, when sediment gets into the waterways, uh, uh, the phosphorus, for instance, uh, binds really tightly with, uh, with soil and uh, can create a lot of uh, uh, extra growth in the lakes that uh, we don't necessarily want to see. So, uh, so those are some highlights uh, for you. Uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity pr to present and, uh, and also thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, make an impact on the community and, uh, and to uh, contribute to your vision of the municipality. Uh, thank you very much and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mark. Good presentation. I'll just get a motion to receive. Councillor Dunn and Seymour Fagan. Uh, questions? Councillor Dunn, go ahead. Yeah, just one quick one. Um, our lake management plans, they're going to now morph into a, a regular operating uh, scenario that's a special project for the city. As in every year, we're, there's certain things we're going to have to do to maintain the gains we've made. Is that correct? Yes, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. Uh, this is something that is approved by by council. Uh, this this plan here is really adapted to the uh, to the five year plan that was passed by council. Uh, a couple of years ago and uh, what I would envision is that uh, we would get a, a task force working again uh, once the plan comes up for renewal and uh, and then we would have that sanctioned by council again and that really works well in terms of the timelines for uh, for the changes to the Conservation Authorities Act uh, as well so uh, an agreement by the municipality to to fund that program uh, and it is entirely uh, in the municipal uh, domain for for funding thank you Thank you. Councillor Ashmore, go ahead. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to, to Mark. Um, with Along the question, previous question about lake management plans, has the uh, Pigeon Lake and Sturgeon Lake management plan been basically finished, or are we still working on that for those two lakes? I didn't see them up on the screen there. I just saw Lake Del Rimple, which is fine, but we were still working. I thought we were still working on uh, Pigeon Lake and Sturgeon Lake. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, those those plans are completed. Uh, happy to uh, um, uh, to announce that. So the the Lake Dalrymple project is the the only active lake management plan that is uh, currently ongoing. Uh, the other ones were completed in in previous years. Thanks. And just one more question. Um, as far as your office, since we're in stage four, I believe, of the reopening act, when would you foresee your office being reopened again? Uh, thank you. So we are uh, currently open for appointment only, uh, and uh, so there is an ability for everyone to uh, still reach us. Uh, we do plan on opening up the office. Uh, I have staff coming back November 15th uh, to the office and uh, do the pandemic numbers. That looks like uh, we're, we're right on, on pace for, for that. So that is the date that we'll start to, uh, to open up. Thank you. Any other questions for Mark? Council Riley? Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mark, for your report again. Um, on the weed control in your number, you mentioned a number of lakes there, and uh, I guess, and you, I guess, uh, could, is there going to be any update on the progress report? Uh, you touched on it in your uh, in your uh, pre in your preview, but I also was wondering. I think there was a six thousand dollar grant. You said at the end. Would there be any opportunity for uh, uh, landowners to actually make donations or? Uh, do matching money to get a larger grant for weed control and uh, lakes, uh, like particular skewgog or sturgeon or pigeon? Uh, thank you. So uh, we're always willing to accept uh, any uh, any donations that, uh, that come our way and, uh, and we do have an ability to uh, define where they go to. So certainly that is a possibility. Uh, we're always looking for ways to leverage uh, money as well. So uh, academia is pretty important to us. Uh, we find that there's some good leveraging that's uh, possible through through that. Uh, certainly any opportunities that are there, we're willing to work with landowners and uh, uh, try and get as much, uh, much leverage uh, as we can for, uh, for the work that we do. Uh, and um, uh, the the other question that you had there, uh, um, uh, could you refresh well, my yeah, memory on that one? Mark, is there a progress report or an update or uh, you did touch on yes. it briefly, but yeah. Yeah, uh, we are planning on uh, providing a, an update. Uh, 
uh, for council on the progress to date on the programs in progress, which will be a three year update. Uh, uh, so it's sort of halfway through the uh, through the action plan, uh, which we figure is a pretty good uh, a pretty good gauge. And uh, and I see that as something that we can follow up with a presentation to council as well for uh, for a little bit more of an intimate uh, look at the uh, the implementation. Okay, good. Thank you. Any other questions for Mark? Seeing none, we have a motion to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for joining us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. We'll move down to item 7.4, which is the Cortha Lakes Halliburton Housing Corporation 2022 Operating Capital Budget Presentation by Kirsten Maxwell, Chief Executive Officer, Cortha Lakes Halliburton Housing Corporation. Welcome. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. We can hear you just um, fine, Mr. so go Mayor, ahead, please. Very good. Very good. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council. I want to thank you for your time today. This is my first time addressing many of you. Um, and I also want to recognize and thank the councillors who serve on the KLH board, Councillor Dunn Archer, and also Director Councillor Elmsley for their time and advice. I'm very happy to be here to give this presentation. Um, my first is the new CEO of KLH Housing Corporation. I'm excited about tackling the many challenges that are in front of us, as well as the many opportunities that are open to us. Um, today, I will talk a little bit about the highlights of some of our recent activities, um, the main, many factors that are currently impacting our budget, and some of the 22 2022 budget considerations, um, including costs and revenues that we have limited control over. Um, and I'll end with a slide of the budget subsidy request for 2022 compared to previous budgets and trends. So next slide, please. As lo has long been a key KLH goal, we are continuously working to improve not just how KLH does our work, um, but also tenants' lives, the whole housing system, and the whole community. Unfortunately, like everything else, uh, the pandemic has set us and our tenants back in numerous ways, um, but it's also created opportunities and spawned some innovative ideas. Um, so adding more housing units remains a key area of focus, and KLH has added 29 units this year, eight as in purchase of a women's resources center uh, property at 11 West Street in Fenland Falls, um, and also 21 units in the completion of the project called Hope's Trails Project in Minden. Um, and we expect to have two, if not three, new development projects breaking ground spring of 2022. Facilities and building team led by Don Quibel are really great at maximizing the use of funds to keep our buildings in good condition. This year doing much needed delayed bathroom renovations to two buildings. Um, and we are continuing to prioritize energy efficiency at every opportunity, both in terms of repairs and renovations, um, as well as our new build projects. Those who are the most vulnerable are generally impacted the most by tragedy and certainly our tenants through the pandemic is no, are no exception. Um, much of the supports that tenants relied on prior to the pandemic um, have been inaccessible for an extended time. Tenants experiencing isolation um, and various increased challenges. Um, led by Shelley Smith, the tenant relations team have and continue to put out many fires and, and provide a great deal of support to tenants. Um, and they have been unfortunately unable to do many of their proactive community development activities. Um, and we are hoping very much that in the future, very soon they'll be able to get back to that work. Um, Pandemic recovery is certainly going to take some time, um, as well as consistent collaborative efforts by multiple sectors and many organizations. Um, this work is underway, and I think it will serve everyone, particularly KLH and our tenants, well long into the future um, once the world has found our new equilibrium. Um, the 10-year strategic plan remains our primary guidance document. 
um, but we are reviewing just the priority of some of the uh, strategies to account from some of the current realities of pandemic recovery. Finally, um, building and strengthening partnerships has been an area of strong focus, um, but even greater emphasis through the pandemic. Um, my first day was right in the middle of the outbreak at 68 Lindsay Street North. Um, while it was a very difficult situation for everyone, we're very grateful that no one lost their lives. Um, and while it was a very challenging situation, there were also um, benefits that came out of it. Um, for instance, it created more awareness uh, in the health sector of some of the difficulties that our high needs tenants have in accessing health care. And as a result, community care offered uh, the services of a nurse who is now providing a weekly clinic in the 68 Lindsay Street North building um, that all of our tenants are able to access and it has been a great success with some tenants um, able to access medical, regular medical services for the first time in quite some time. Next slide, please. KLH budget uh, costs and revenues are to a large extent determined by external factors. Um, first, the city imposes uh, certain expenses um, in terms of the staffing that are contracted, city employees. Um, as well as property taxes and water utilities. Um, the province, through various legislation, the Housing Services Act and its regulations, the Residential Tenancies Act, the Landlord Tenant Board, set largely the parameters we work within, um, including rents we can charge, relationships with the tenants, and so on. Planning and building legislation, as well as the market, market determine the cost of developing new housing, um, and the upper levels of government control um, the large extent of the purse strings of capital funding for development. Um, in terms of tenants, um, I think the gaps between different aspects of the support system that many of them rely on have widened through the pandemic. Um, and this has meant that KLH has been dealing with um, more issues and more complex issues than, than previous. Next slide, please. So in 2022, um, I noted we have the projects breaking ground in spring 2022. Um, while it is a capital matter, um, ultimately it impacts our operating budget as well. Um, and I just wanna note that development has become more challenging with the cost of materials and supplies, um, as well as the availability of tradespeople through the pandemic. Um, I have heard just today, actually, that some of this is starting to ease and we're optimistic that costs will be reduced in the future, um, but they aren't really expected to go to pre-pandemic levels. Um, you may be aware of MPAC previously assessing community housing providers as they would private rental providers, um, increasing KLH's cost significantly, um, and that uh, there have been ongoing appeals for several years. Uh, we have received successful conclusion of a number of those appeals uh, recently, which will continue to reduce costs. Um, pandemic related uh, expenses and, and some changes. Um, there has been some reduction in revenues, some rent arrears, um, the 1.5% rent freeze imposed by the province really has set us back essentially a year uh, perpetually behind inflation, um, which amounts to approximately $60,000 a year. Um, unit turnover was slower during the lockdown, um, both the challenges of showing safely showing units to tenants, um, as well as doing uh, unit turnover, um, accessing supplies, and again, contractors uh, to do needed repairs. Um, in terms of recovery, alongside housing staff, the focus really is on getting supports in place and back in place. Uh, for tenants, and as I noted, a large component of this is strengthening partnerships with support and other service providers. 
Um, there have been significant success stories. Um, um, we've also taken advantage of some provincial pandemic funding to um, long-term benefit of KLH and tenants. Um, in particular, we have been in the process of installing internet uh, for our video systems, uh, which enable access to the video from anywhere um, and thereby freeing up some of our direct service staff who work in the buildings um, instead to spend more time focusing on dealing with tenant issues rather than sitting there um, reviewing security video footage. Um, we have also used provincial funds to uh, secure a roving security team um, after the success of the security detail at 68 Lindsay Street North. Um, we wanted to also provide that at some of the other hotspots um, you know, that change over time. Um, and this has had a tremendous impact. Uh, tenants report a much increased sense of safety. Um, and in particular, they're reporting that the security detail have been really great at de-escalating situations before they become significant problem and even being proactive with relationships with tenants um, and uh, you know, treating tenants and, and everyone with considerable respect. Next slide, please. But the operating subsidy request has remained the same as previous years. You'll see straight through from 2018 through to 2022. Um, although this has been possible due to various savings um, good use of the provincial pandemic funding and substantially drawing on reserves as well to offset costs, um, a lot, some of which was certainly planned. Um, pressures include inflationary costs overall, as well as a significant increase in insurance costs, increased building and maintenance costs, as well as, um, as I noted earlier, the 2021 rent freeze. We are in relatively good shape with rent arrears, although there certainly has been some impact from financial uh, challenges tenants have experienced. Um, but our tenant support staff have been very aggressive in terms of developing repayment plans with tenants. Um, and at times provincial funds have been available um, to support tenants in paying rent arrears, which has been quite helpful for us as well. Although I, I just will note that over time, it is becoming increasingly difficult to maintain that same uh, amount of subsidy. Um, the increase, I'll just quickly note, in the capital subsidy amount really is necessary to prevent a backlog of repairs in, in future years. Um, facility staff do what they can to you know, make the life of various building systems last as long as possible um, and quite successful in that through timely you know good maintenance and timely repairs and as well they do as much of the work as possible in-house uh, which saves considerably on contractors um, its specific pressures include move out repairs um, bathroom renovations that were delayed from last year um, balcony repairs and next slide. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and councillors for your time this afternoon. Uh, KLH and I are really looking forward to 2022. We are coming out of the pandemic somewhat bruised, um, but ultimately I think stronger than before and in a better position um, to take the organization and our tenants forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, for the presentation. Well done. I'll just get a good motion to receive from Councillor Dunn and, and Elmsley. Uh, any questions uh, regarding our housing? Well, it looks like you're getting off the hook easy today. So uh, we have a motion <laughs> all to receive, right. all in favor? That's passed. Thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay, we'll move right down to item 7.5, which is the Kawartha Lakes Library Board 2022 budget presentation by Jamie Anderson, Chief Librarian at the Kawartha Lakes Library. Can you hear me, Jamie? I can, Mr. Mayor. And we can hear you just fine, so go ahead, please. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, there we go. Uh, can you move on to the next slide, please? 
Hello, and thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council, for this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. While I'm speaking to you by myself, um, I do want to acknowledge the work of Susan Ferguson, the library board chair, um, as well as Carolyn Danes, who is the library treasurer, as well as uh, uh, being the city treasurer. Um, as you are aware, that we have 14 branches throughout the city. In a typical week, our branches are open 330 hours uh, to the public. That equates to almost 17,000 public hours per year. Um, as of uh, so beginning of September, all branches are now open to their normal pre-COVID hours. Uh, our current complement of staff is nine full-time staff, um, approximately 30 part-time staff, um, giving us a, uh, an approximate FTE of about 26, just a little hair under 26 um, FTE. Next slide, please. <clears throat> like, 20, like 2020, 2021 has been the tumultuous year for us and the city. Um, we have been slowly expanding library services and programs as health measures lift. Um, as well, we've been expanding uh, our community partnerships with uh, groups such as Pinwalk, Early On, Boys and Girls Club, and Ontario Parks, just to name a few this year. Um, as the CAO from Core the Conversation, Conservation mentioned, uh, we set up a, a story walk in the Ken Reed um, conservation area last December and it proved to be very, very popular. We've expanded that throughout the city. Um, every community has had at least one, if not more, um, story walks set up in their areas. Um, and they've proved quite popular with uh, families, giving them an opportunity to kind of get out of the house, uh, disconnect from the, the computer screens for a little while. Uh, we've even done two um, historical story walks that we've had uh, in place throughout the summer uh, here in Lindsay, as well as rotating it through uh, Fenland and I think Bob Cajun as well. Um, because of uh, health restrictions, uh, especially on programming, we've had greater focus on uh, with our early literacy programming um, being kind of take home uh, stuff for parents, material for parents to uh, access. We've developed grab-and-go pre-built book bundles based on different themes and topics. Um, a get ready to read uh, literacy pack, which is uh, books, um, puzzles, and um, other uh, you know, songs and rhymes to help small children getting ready to actually go to school for the first time, um, as well as developing uh, full steam ahead take-home kits. Um, these are smaller, um, scientific experiments or scientific crafts that kids can do on their own at home and keep. Also, <clears throat> also in the spring of this year, um, we launched our cognitive kits. These are activity kits designed for people who are living with dementia and their caregivers. They were developed uh, with uh, Kortha Lakes Alzheimer's Society. Um, and we were actually one of the first library systems in Ontario to develop this program. And it's proved to be quite successful so far. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As health restrictions have allowed, uh, we have begun to offer more in-person programming and services. At the same time, we do continue to grow our digital presence and resources um, that are available to the public, expanding digital uh, offerings, as well as virtual story times um, and other online programs. From January 1st through to early July, except for a, a brief period there in uh, February and March, uh, we were, the library was a pickup only service. We weren't not allowing people into the buildings. Um, since July 1st, all branches have been open to the public for in-person service. This year, we were able to relaunch our summer reading club uh, focused entirely on outdoor activities. Um, typically, we have about 500 children participate in the program through the summer. This year, we were at about 350, not to our, our pre-COVID levels, but I was still quite happy with that number this year. Uh, as I mentioned, we are, whenever, during the summer months, whenever possible, we focused on uh, outdoor programming. We had outdoor story times and things like that. Um, as well, we've had success with various online programs, such as online book clubs um, and Spice Club, which is a, an online cooking group with a different spice each month um, that currently has about 80 active participants. Uh, all staff, are, all available staff are back to work in the branches. Um, performance indicators are down, but in this year we are seeing several branches, the circulation numbers for several of our branches actually getting close to pre-COVID levels or, or equaling those. So we are taking that as a, 
a encouraging uh, sign for us. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Some of our 2022 strategic priorities will be to develop a new strategic plan but by the end of the year uh, for launch in 2023. This plan will be developed in-house. Um, we are looking to continue to expand our in-person programming offerings as well as experimenting with different kind of hybrid programs, whether we can have uh, you know, multiple locations, multiple branches kind of participate at the same time in a program online. We, work to, uh, we are continuing to work uh, assisting with community recovery. Uh, we'll be working with the city with regards to the Bob Cajun renovation and relocation project. Uh, construction hopefully will start fairly soon on that with anticipated um, move in sometime late uh, summer of 2022. Um, we are also working with the city to expand our uh, footprint into the adult ed side of the uh, Fenland Falls library branch that we've been making use of that with for programming space and it's proved quite successful, especially because it has a exterior access um, to the space. Um, and then further expanding partnerships within the community itself. Next slide, please. <clears throat> On to the budget. Our expected revenues for 2022 should be in line with 2021. The expected total revenues for, for 2022 are $272,333. We have not had any changes within our um, government grants or, or operating grants at, at this point. We had one removed a couple of years ago, a uh, smaller one, but uh, all others seem to be in place still. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Uh, library expenditures. Uh, so for the uh, 2020, in 2021 and this year, uh, our overall expenditures for this year are expected to be $2,309,143. This is being offset by accessing library reserves of $131,423. This brings the library's 2021 total expenditures down to $2,177,720. In 2022, we are looking at an expected increase of about $46,000 to our salaries and wages budget line. Through adjustments and consolidations within our library operations budget line, we should see a savings here of about $12,000. Our collections budget will rise also in 2022 by about $26,000. This budget has remained the same for the three previous budget years. Um, but we are seeing a lot of inflationary pressures on this, uh, this budget line. Um, there's a lot of, uh, just like everything else, um, a lot of supply chain issues. Um, and uh, we're seeing month long, you know, multiple month long delays in, in material as well as an increasing in the cost there as well. Um, additionally, we have contractual annual increases in the leases of both the Dunsford and Omimi libraries. These are our only two branches that we rent from private individuals or organizations. We should also be able to see savings in our electronic resources budget of about $6,500 next year without losing any access to our current suite of titles. Uh, this is through some consortial purchases. For 2022, we should see an increase in our overall expenditures of $54,572. To cover this increase in expenditures, the library will, library will again access funds um, in our reserves to offset this amount. Additionally, the library is looking to install compact shelving in the Lindsay Library. This will allow us to consolidate three archive and storage areas into one room, freeing up additional space for library services. This program is estimated to be $45,000 and will be also entirely covered out of library reserves. With the compact shelving project and the general expenditure increases, it is expected for the library's library to access $99,572 from current reserves in 2022. This will give the library the total expenditures in 2022 of $2,309,143. Next slide, please. So just to briefly recap, the library is anticipating total revenues in 2022 of about $272,000. 
As indicated on the previous slide, the library expects the key drivers and changes to expenditures to be the contractual salary increases and inflationary increases to our, our book budget. With anticipated overall expenditures in 2022 of $2,408,715 offset by the, the accessing of library reserve funds of $99,572, this will bring the total expenditures for the year down to 2,309,143. The overall net budget request for the library in 2022 will be $2,036,810, an increase of $131,423 in 2021, which was offset by accessing library reserves last in this current year, sorry. Next slide, please. Um, that is my presentation, uh, and if there's any, so I thank you for this time as well as for any questions. Thanks, Jamie. I'll just get a motion to receive, uh, Councillor Vale and Richardson. Uh, questions? Councillor Helmsley, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Jamie, for your presentation. Just uh, a couple of clarifications, if I could. Um, you have under revenues, fines, and fees, did we not uh waive library fines we did we do have uh one small uh fine that we we have to keep in place that is for uh interlibrary loans so if a, another library system charges us fines we pass those on to the uh the user those are pretty rare but there are some there um as well the the fees category would be for lost material or damaged material Thank you. Uh, the, uh, another clarification, under your expenses, it says transfers to reserves. Should that be transfers from reserves? Um, yes, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, I just wanted to make sure because it uh, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> certainly makes a difference. And finally- Yes, it does. <laughs> um, how much, uh, could you tell me what you, what the library reserve is currently, please? Um, I, sorry, I can't, I would have to pass that over to Carolyn Baines to give us uh, an exact number on that. I can ask her when we do the full budget, unless she wants to answer right okay. now. <laughs> um, currently there is approximately, I, I'd have to look it up myself, but uh, $750,000 in the library reserve. Thank you. They uh, they use they, yeah they use funds last year to help with the construction of the Bob Cajun Library and they've used funds in the last two years to assist with uh, the operating budget. And of course they've had a they had a surplus in twenty twenty in twenty twenty yes. Thank you. Any further questions for the uh, Jamie Library Board? Seeing none, we have a motion to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you, Jamie. Appreciate your time today. Thank you. Okay, let's move right into item 7.6, which is a Cortha Lakes Healthcare Initiative, Doctor Recruitment 2022 budget presentation. I think Linda Curtin, our treasurer for the Cortha Lakes Healthcare Initiative and Cindy Snyder are both joining us. Welcome. Can you hear me okay? Hmm. I can hear you, can you hear me? We can hear you just fine, so go ahead, please. Okay. Um, I'm Linda, it looks like Linda might be having a bit of issue with her camera, but I'm going to start anyway. I'm going to say good afternoon. There she is. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Uh, I think everyone, of course, knows who I am. So it is my pleasure to introduce Linda Curtin, who is presenting here today. Linda joined the KLHCI board in December 2020 and jumped right into our treasurer role. She is a senior executive with over 20 years of corporate leadership experience. She has held senior roles with private entrepreneurial, owner managed organizations and large national corporations as uh, director of finance and chief financial officer. She has a solid audit background holding positions in both internal and external, external auto audit roles. Well, I could talk earlier. She is currently a principal with the CFO Center, offering professional, professional services on a part-time basis to small and to mid-sized enterprises. Linda is a CPA, CA, and has a Bachelor of Accounting from Brock University. She and her husband have three very active boys and proudly own a cash crop farming operation just west of Lindsay. 
And I'd also like on behalf of the board to acknowledge Councillor Vail, who sits on our board and thank him for all of his guidance over these past few years. I am going to ask for our first slide and pass this to Linda. Thank you, Cindy, for that lovely introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for inviting us uh, to present at, uh, in your meeting today and give you uh, an update of where the board is. Uh, as Cindy said, I joined in December um, and it was a great opportunity to uh, give back in a community that uh, I have lived in for uh, several years However, due to work and family commitments have been unable to um, contribute in this, this manner. So I, I thank the organization for giving me this opportunity. Um, so as with everything, when I joined the board, we were in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of figuring out what a virtual world means and how to move forward. Um, the board had this uh, you know, pretty much under control when I joined, I just added, uh, a couple different little elements to it. Um, we had put, or they had put uh, strategic planning aside for a while until we can meet in person. Um, traditionally, this is the, of course, the easiest way to, to move forward with your plan. Though as time passed, we quickly saw that uh, we needed to move forward and attempt to a virtual planning session on a virtual basis. Uh, so we invited some of our partners um, and together we were able to revisit the strategic plan for the next three years with the existing board members and several of our community partners joining us. Uh, one of the things that we did is we did a, uh, we wanted to look back to ensure that our mandate as a board we're in line with our vision and our mission. And we took a lot of time and careful consideration to make sure that we had the right vision um, and mission going forward. And we did some word changes to it. And I just like to share this with you. So this is the first slide. Um, and it is our belief, it takes an entire community to recruit a family physician. Um, our vision, is that all the city of Quartha Lake citizens have access to a local family doctor. And our mission is to create a healthier community by recruiting, supporting, and retaining family doctors. Right, next slide, please. And through this process, there was a, a lot of interaction uh, that we were able to get from both our partners and the board members and it was very clear at the end of it that we had some really strong core values within the group. We had never really documented them or shared them with anybody. So I'm sharing them with you today. Um, the group is in you know, excellence. Uh, they all go above and beyond to make sure that the mandate of the board is fulfilled and they do everything that they can, um, volunteering uh, to make sure everything is successful. Everyone acts with integrity, ethical and moral standards are fully backed up. Ingenuity, they, they find solutions, improve and evolve. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet some of the board members that have been there since inception and they continually look for different ways uh, to make this successful. And heart, they all act with heart, the passion to make a difference um, is, is truly remarkable. Um, and lastly, partnerships. It was recognized that we can't do this alone and together is better and it's with the uh, community that we can make a difference. Uh, next slide, please. All right, I'm going to have to just pull my, um, my slide up beside me as I can't see it. So I'm just speaking to the right box here. So we took our strategic objectives and we tried to simplify them and we put them into four pillars um, and to really be clearly and articulate exactly what we wanted to do. So the four pillars that we come up with was recruit, retain, partner, and accountability. Recruit being the main purpose and mandate of the board. Um, and we continue to cultivate a family medicine residency program, which has been successful in the past. 
to enhance medical learners program by increasing preceptors and family doctor engagement. To provide both virtual and personal unique experiences to aid in assessing if Kawartha Lakes is the right fit from both the incoming professional and the city of Kawartha Lakes. Understand our candidates' interests, career stage, and desired opportunities. Uh, we, we dove down into this one uh, to really see the different age groups, the different needs um, that everybody would want. For example, a younger person graduate has different needs than someone near the end of their career. Um, someone moving in with a family has different needs and, and they have other sources that are affecting their decisions. So it's really narrowing in and making sure that we're meeting the needs of every group. And then offer turnkey solutions, specs, practices, and business coaching. Something that some of the you know, younger graduates don't always get coming out of medical school. So after recruiting, of course, the idea is just to retain them. So our focus is on supporting new and current family doctors with their needs and aspirations. Provide a network to support the family needs and interests. This goes back again to there's other stakeholders, not just particularly the medical professional that we need to think of. Uh, advocate for professional office space in the community. If we recruit in order to retain them, we have to have space for them to operate. And then collaborate, support and provide a voice within the community partnerships on their behalf. And that takes us to our third pillar, which is partnerships. And of course, it's strengthen is together is better is our motto uh, with the Ross Memorial Hospital, with the city, yourselves, with the Ontario Health Team having a voice at the provincial level, um, our local family medicine healthcare partners, and then local organizations and service groups. Uh, we want to advocate and educate to foster a greater knowledge of what this organization does for the city and the citizens. And then lastly, of course, is accountability, you know, safeguarding our financial health, strengthen our resilience. Uh, you know, we've, we've got a depth, a level of knowledge in our board, um, and we want to ensure that that uh, is there for the continued future. And then, of course, ensure all organizations or activities are delivered through the lens of diversity, um, both from a social and uh, ethical point of view. We're all unique in our own um, individual differences, bring the collaboration together to make us better. Okay, next slide, please. And of course, you all know Cindy, she didn't need an introduction and she will take you into the day-to-day -day operations that's been happening behind the scenes. Thanks, Linda. Uh, the overall numbers, this slide being on medical students and our family medicine residents, which is an important program for recruitment in uh, for the city. So, but the overall number of medical learners that have trained in the city since the beginning of the pandemic has decreased due to changes being required. Many of them had to start training uh, virtually, unfortunately. And, and so we were restricted, especially in the early, times in, in early 2020 in regards to how many we could have in the area. However, we did have a slight increase uh, in family medicine residents, which is always a positive. Mostly they came from the Queen's program that is in Peterborough when their rotations at other areas were canceled because of the pandemic, we were able to absorb them at the hospital into our into an emergency rotation or a hospitalist medicine rotation. There has been, uh, it was the medical students in particular that decreased in their numbers here because they went to virtual and the, any clinical work they were doing had to be done at their own home universities and not uh, outside of the areas. But these restrictions are slowly lifting and hopefully by this time uh, next year, we'll be back up to the numbers that we would normally have training here. And training here has proven to be a successful recruitment tool. They, we do have a few of our family doctors who did train with us before choosing to practice here. I'd also like to note at this point that we cannot provide this training without the support of all the physicians in the city of Quartha Lakes, and that's family physicians and specialists. 
And I wish to publicly thank them uh, for their most valuable part of this part of the program. Next slide, please. KLHCI has continued to hold all the meetings virtually throughout this past year. I continue to, I work a mixed blend. I'm at the hospital now a couple of days a week and then working from home. So it's a little bit of a mix. Certainly during the major lockdowns and stay at home orders, I have worked from home. And, but as we said, all our meetings have been held virtually. University recruitment events over the past year were also held virtually, which was certainly a little different. I was pleased just uh, last month, though, to be able to attend a mask to mask event uh, with McMaster at their Kitchener Waterloo site. Not sure, haven't heard from any of the other universities if they will switch away from virtual this year or not. I think everyone, again, is still up in the air as, as things are reopening. Next slide, please. We were able and have just completed our virtual community tour, and we were hoping to show it to you at the moment, but found out that uh, we're not able to do that on uh, through the slide. Uh, so there will be a new press release about this coming out very soon with the link. And also, uh, if you've got a chance and can write it down now, please have a look. And special thanks, of course, to Mayor Lethem for being part of our new video. Next slide. This is probably the slide that you are most interested in or could be most interested in. Uh, I'd like to start with, even with all of our hard work, uh, we, the need for family physicians in the city of Kawartha Lakes is still growing. And I also ask that you remember that the lack of family physicians in rural areas is a Canada-wide issue, not just for ourselves. And there are a few reasons why our need is growing in particular. New family physicians, prefer to have a smaller practice in order to include not just clinic work, but say they want to work in the hospital with hosp as do some hospitalist work, do some emergency work, uh, include long-term care. And on top of that, still maintain a good work-life balance. We have a number of upcoming retirements in the city in 2022 and 2023. And these practices are larger which means we are going to need to recruit two to replace one over these next few years. And also in our planning, we have factored in the expected growth for the city in population, so that adds to it. Uh, note also that although Covaconk isn't included on this slide, we will begin recruiting for them once shovels are in the ground for their new medical center. I want to mention virtual and in-person site visits are continuing and there are a number of active files on my desk that I'm hoping will lead to successful recruits by uh, this time next year uh, and through the summer and this time, this time next year. And uh, hopefully we will nibble away again at those uh, projected needs that we have. Next slide. And back to Linda. Oh, at, at the end of our strategic planning session, it gave us an opportunity to look back uh, and look at our budget for the, for the upcoming year to see that we had all the funds needed to operate and to run the programs that we wanted to um, under our uh, four pillars. Um, at this point, uh, we have a small deficit in the 2022 budget. Um, our request to the city is the same operating fund as last year, of course, with any um, increase, I believe it's a 1% increase. Uh, at this time, we're not asking for education funds. Um, we have the funds set up there to support the existing doctors that are here. Um, and as we move forward, we'll assess, uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll have new recruits to come to you with, uh, you know, and to be asking for the support for them as well. Okay, next slide, please. And, you know, we're looking for someone who could just stretch with the demands of the job as everybody in this uh, pandemic. We hope you're flexible. Next slide. And if there's any questions, we, uh, Cindy and I would be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much both for your presentation. I'll just uh, get a motion to receive and we'll see if there's any questions. Councillor Bale and O'Reilly, any questions for uh, uh, Cindy or Linda? on doctor recruitment. Councillor Ashmore, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to either Cindy or Linda. 
Um, the first question is, there was a recent announcement that doctors who are foreign trained can start their practice earlier. They don't have to have a certain time period where they have to relicense or re-exam. I'm just wondering, will that help us? Have you, have you um, got any news from the ministry as to how that's going to help us here locally with doctor recruitment? I haven't received anything either through, um, I still want to call them Health Force Ontario, um, or uh, the College of Family Physicians or and the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, but it certainly would be beneficial to everyone if they're not having to, uh, to either be, they probably, I'm expecting they would still probably need to be certified or and certified and require uh, supervision, but they may not be requiring them to actually attend a residency program. But it's certainly something that will be on our radar as soon as we're able to receive more information. Okay, thanks. And finally, as the slide shows, there's still lots of people who do not have doctors. What's the number that people can call right now? Is it telehealth or do you have a number handy that people can call that want to get a doctor? It, yes, it is Healthcare Connect. And give me one second and I can give you the number and their website. And this puts them on, it's a local, they, they will be uh, connected with someone that looks after the local area and able to uh, help them out. And of course I can't, there it is. So the number is 1-800-44, oh, sorry, 1-888-218-9929. There are two numbers. That's for Service Ontario. If they are actually registered with a physician somewhere outside the area, they will have to deroster, as it's called, and they do that through Service Ontario. Uh, by contacting Healthcare Connect, they'll also get that information, and their number is 1 800 445 1822, or they can be accessed through Ontario.ca slash Healthcare Connect. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for either? Seeing none, we have a motion to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you both for your presentation. Appreciate it. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's just keep going on our last presentation. Last but not least, uh, Lindsay Downtown BIA, the 2022 budget presentation by Melissa McFarland, the executive director at the Lindsay Downtown BIA. And I do believe that's Mr. Podolsky behind her. Hello. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Yeah, we can hear you just fine, so go uh, ahead. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Uh, thank you once again for giving the Lindsay Downtown BIA the opportunity to present our proposed 2022 budget. Uh, as you are all aware, this past year was like no other for small business. The challenges faced by our membership was unprecedented. With the last phase of construction almost upon us and the reality of learning to cope with this pandemic becoming easier every day, we feel downtown Lindsay is poised to be better than ever moving into the future. Before we go through the presentation prepared by Melissa, I just wanted to take uh, the opportunity to thank our two council representatives, Pat Dunn and Pat O'Reilly for their participation on our board and our subcommittees. So as you can see on your screen, we're first talking about our 2022 budget. Our fiscal year does run the same as the calendar year. So we are talking about January 1st to December 31st of 2022. Next slide, please. Um, I think everybody has uh, been familiar with what we do over the years, but a quick overview. We are a municipal board um, of City of Fourth Lakes Council. Um, basically, we are just dedicated to the um, advocacy of behalf of our downtown businesses. We oversee all of the beautification, improvement, maintenance of the downtown area. Uh, we coordinate marketing and special events that promote the downtown uh, and always looking to maintain and improve the economic prosperity of the downtown. Next slide. So a brief overview of how we are funded, and it's, I think, between my PowerPoint and your PowerPoint, we've sort of lost a little bit of our formatting, but um, basically uh, the 2018 tax levy, um, our tax levy is funded through property owners of the downtown most often, 
the property owners will pass those on to the businesses since it is the businesses um, who benefit most from having a BIA. Um, but the vast majority of our funding does come from uh, that from municipal tax levy. So um, we've done various types of increases over the years. There was a large increase prior to 2018 uh, to bring us to where we have been for the last couple of years. Um, our intention was to do small sort of cost of living increases every year after that. Uh, in order to make sure that we sort of never put the burden of a large increase on our membership base um, again. So in 2019, we did increase uh, by two and a half percent. And then in 2020 and 2021, in light of first reconstruction of the downtown, and then last year in light of the reconstruction and COVID-19, uh, we chose not to do any increases at all. Didn't want to sort of put the additional burden on the businesses in the midst of those two things. As those two things were sort of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, um, we have decided to do uh, an increase this year. Um, we were looking at um, how we could justify an increase each year and how we could come up with a number um, that we would feel comfortable with uh, to do sort of a small annual increase. So we were advised um, that the, the best way to do that and to sort of be able to justify a number going forward each year um, is to use the consumer price index. So what we did is we looked at the consumer price index, all that data is available on the government website um, and it goes month to month. So being that we prepare um, our budget for September, uh, we were looking from August, 2020 to August, 2021 and the cost of it living increase for the CPI was 3.7. So going forward, our intention is to use that number um, each year. So 3.7%, um, that's only just over $5,000 to be distributed as an increase among all of the properties, which is the total tax assessment of all of the value of the properties downtown. Next slide. So in addition to the municipal tax levy, we do um, generally get the same types of uh, funding sources throughout the year. Um, historically, we have received $35,000. Um, from the Community Partnership and Development Fund. This is matching funds for beautification expenses in the downtown. Um, we look after all of the beautification in downtown, plants, flowers, um, replacement trees, any um, maintenance of street furniture downtown, flags, signage, um, and as well as the maintenance, which is a huge expense. So um, we have always um, at least matched that $35,000. In the last few years, we have actually added another $10,000 from our budget. Um, so that we are actually putting in $45,000 towards beautification annually. Um, up until last year, we've received $35,000. Um, and then going forward, we're requesting an additional 10, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, we also get the Canada Summer Jobs Grant. Generally, that happens annually. We can use this for marketing and events or special projects. And we usually get about $5,000 back towards our payroll costs. Um, between eight and nine thousand dollars comes back from our HST rebate. Again, this is, comes through the city, um, and they pass that on to us annually. Uh, and then historically, for the last couple of years, we have been receiving thirty thousand uh, dollars from the city uh, towards our community liaison position, uh, who, among other things, includes the parking uh, bylaw enforcement of the downtown area. And of course, we're always looking for additional grant funding through the year uh, when we require it and when it's available to us. Next slide. So for this upcoming year, uh, we just have a couple of small additional asks in addition to the increase to the levy that I spoke about before. Uh, so we are asking for a renewal for our community liaison position. So um, in 2019, that was technically the end of the two year pilot project for the position. Um, council has been renewing the funding for both 2020 and 2021, um, pending the results of the parking strategy. So that was delayed by COVID-19. Um, we did receive those results back in June of 2021. And in the parking study that was recommended that this program be kept in place, they seemed actually quite impressed with it, did recommend um, that it be installed in other communities. Um, so we do ask that we are able to keep that position. And we are asking for just a small cost of living increase of $2,500. Uh, bringing the contribution from 30,000 uh, to 32,500. Uh, we are also asking, as I spoke of before, for an additional $10,000 um, from the Community Partnership and Development Fund, 50-50 for beautification. Like I said before, we have always put in $45,000 towards beautification, um, but only received 35,000 um, as the matching fund. So I believe last year, 
um, this $10,000 request that we had also made last year was approved. It didn't come through the community partnership grant, but it was provided, I believe, from another city budget. Um, so the community partnership uh, application is actually just due on Friday. I just submitted it. And I did ask for that $10,000 in that application um, from community services. Um, I believe this may be something that we're going to require regularly going forward. Reconstruction has been incredible for the downtown. We're so excited about the results of that. But with that, of course, is coming increased costs um, that will fall under our responsibility. So planters, uh, new banners for the lampposts, Christmas decorations for the lampposts, um, all of those will be in our budget for the next few years. Um, as well, the lampposts that went on Lindsay Street South are out of our geographical area. So we have never provided plant material or maintenance for them before, but we are doing that now just to maintain the consistency through the downtown. So there is an additional cost there. And as well, the new bump out planters are large. They are getting an initial planting as part of the reconstruction, but maintenance and planting material for those going forward will be our responsibility as well. And we are realizing that they may need a, a slightly more specialized um, maintenance program going forward uh, to keep them looking nice. So these are all gonna be additional costs. So we are asking for that $10,000 uh, for beautification. Next slide, please. So generally, um, how we would um, outline our budget through the year. So of course, administration, uh, payroll for our various staff members. We are looking at a new office space, which I'll speak about in a moment, um, and then general operating expenses, beautification, all of the things that we look after, uh, which I spoke about before, flowers and trees, all the weeding, maintenance, trash pickup, uh, ashtrays, and the new maintenance uh, for those new planters. Um, and of course, providing all the materials for them um, and general expenses. And then marketing, uh, taking a hit, of course, with COVID-19, but we are getting things back on track with being able to host events downtown, looking at doing one major event per season, um, especially around the holidays, and then what we call small-scale activations, which are just sort of small events uh, that pop up in the downtown from time to time to add some atmosphere downtown. Uh, print, digital, and media promotions, uh, and a new grant program that we're looking to install in 2022. Next slide, please. So new for 2022, um, in this budget, we are looking at a new office space. So currently, uh, our office consists of one small room and another organization's larger office uh, to a multi-office commercial space at 7 York Street South, which is currently vacant. Uh, so over the last couple of years, our organization has grown from one staff member, which is me, uh, to include several part-time and seasonal staff. Uh, the new location, the way we're looking to lay it out, would be professional, accessible for our members and for the public, uh, and ideally located sort of, you know, right on Kent, just off of Kent Street, um, easily accessible, but not taking up a storefront space. Um, and it'll have boardroom space, which has been very difficult for us to procure uh, throughout the pandemic. And the other thing that we're looking at adding in 2022 is what we're calling our event support program. So what we're looking to do is uh, develop a grant program that's going to encourage our local organizations to hold events in the downtown. So what we're going to be doing is we can support these events without having to take on the burden of running them completely ourselves um, by, by providing $2,000 grants uh, for five events per year and also marketing and administration support for those organizations. So this, this we'll do is add a lot of events downtown, make our downtown really thriving, show off all of the improvements from reconstruction. Um, but of course, again, not have the burden of running all of these events uh, with our small organization. So that's a $10,000 uh, program that we're looking to do in 2022. Next slide. Okay, I think that's it for Melissa's presentation. If anybody has any questions. Thank you both. Uh, good presentation. Uh, get a motion to receive, Councillor Dunn and O'Reilly. Uh, questions? Any questions for either from the BIA? Councillor O'Reilly, go ahead. Uh, not really any more questions. Just maybe a little update on when they're hoping to get the downtown completed and about your new office location. A question about the office location? Sorry. Yeah, um, so we have the space currently now. Um, we are lucky because um, Steve Podolsky is the property owner of that space. So the space is currently vacant. If you're familiar, it's the former Terry's Taylor shop. 
uh, location. So it is vacant. Um, the ladies that were running that business retired um, a couple of months ago. So it's currently vacant and needs some renovations. So we're going to start working on that, provided that our budget gets approved. Um, and then we can target the new year um, as far as, as relocating um, to that space. Of course, we're going to be relocating back into the construction um, with York and William Street in phase four of construction. Um, but all of that should be hopefully wrapping up around the same time. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the BIA? Seeing none, we have a motion to receive. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you both for your presentation. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank okay, you. have a good day. Um, that was our last presentation. We don't have anything for closed. Uh, confirming bylaw. I need a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the special council meeting of October 26, 2021. Councillor Elmsley and Yo, all in favor? That's passed. Uh, motion to adjourn. Councillor Yo, seconded by Councillor Dunn. All in favor? That's passed. Thank you. Just a reminder our next meeting is November 2nd. Committee of the Whole it starts at 10 a.m. And we will supply lunch. And there's a shovel turning tomorrow for the seniors' home uh, behind Loblaws at 1130 if anybody wants to attend, especially the Lindsay Councillors, but everybody's welcome. 1130, that big development going on behind Loblaws. Uh, they're doing a shovel turning tomorrow at 1130. So everyone is welcome. Have a good day. Thank you.